This video was made in collaboration with researchers from Monash University and the University of British Columbia. Hello everyone! Have you ever wondered why there are no openly gay NFL or NBA players in 2020? Or have you wondered why LGBTQ athletes might feel excluded from sports? Or are you a part of the LGBTQ community and used to play sports and no longer do? Why is this? In this video, we will be looking at how homophobic and prejudiced language leads to decreased participation and feelings of acceptance in sports from the LGBTQ community, and how changing our social norms can help fix this problem. Sports are fun to watch and playing is great for our health. But the homophobic language LGBTQ kids hear being used when they play sports makes them feel unwelcome. Recent research has found more than half of male athletes admit to recently using homophobic language. Public health officials at the CDC are concerned because this language is bad for the health of LGBTQ kids who are actively avoiding sports. Sports organizations and athletes are also concerned. Star athletes have recorded videos and sports teams hold regular pride games which are designed to end homophobia in sports. But despite these efforts, homophobic language is still extremely common. Researchers have found this language is even used by athletes who support same-sex marriage and have gay friends. So what exactly is going on here? Why do athletes with positive attitudes towards LGBTQ people still use homophobic language? Researchers believe a study from the 1930s provides some answers. Let's travel back in time. It was the early 1900s and Americans were strongly prejudiced against Chinese people. This was deeply rooted in racism and anti-immigrant beliefs. Despite the hostility toward Chinese people, a researcher named Richard LaPierre decided he would join a Chinese couple and travel around the United States. He was curious about how they would be treated when they tried to stay at hotels or eat at restaurants. He expected them to be turned away. To his surprise, they visited over 100 hotels and restaurants and were only turned away once. When LaPierre got home, he decided to mail surveys to all the hotels and restaurants they visited. He also sent the surveys to other hotels and restaurants they had not visited to compare the responses. The survey asked the hotels and restaurants if they would serve a Chinese customer. To his surprise, almost all said no. This included the ones he visited just a few months earlier. But this is confusing. Why did the hotels and restaurants serve the Chinese couple, but in the survey they said they would be turned away? Well, LaPierre theorized that it had to do with conformity of social norms at that time. Social norms are the invisible rules that shape our behavior. We try to do what we think is normal and expected in every situation, and, of course, social norms are different in each social situation. For example, I might swear when I'm playing video games with my friends because it is normal in that situation, but I would never swear in front of my grandmother because I would expect a strong negative reaction. We see a similar situation in LaPierre's study. When the staff at the hotels or restaurants met the Chinese couple in person, the social norm was to be nice and friendly hosts. But when the staff answered the survey, the broader societal social norm in America was to be unwelcoming and racist. That influenced their response. See the difference? So how can this be translated to sports? Homophobic language has been used in sports for a long time. It has become normal. People don't even think about the harm it can cause or don't view this behavior as homophobic. That's because there are no openly gay people around when they use this language. They either hide their sexuality or they have dropped out. At the same time, we are told by sports stars and leaders that we need to be welcoming to the LGBTQ community. Being homophobic is wrong. That is the norm in sports and society. This is why people say they have positive attitudes towards LGBTQ individuals. In most cases, they would probably be nice to a gay person. This shows a disconnect between their attitudes and behaviors. So how do we solve this problem? Researchers say we need to change our approach to combating homophobia in sports. The efforts by athletes and sports leagues are missing the mark entirely. They need to focus on changing the norms, not attitudes, because, as we can now see, our beliefs don't always follow our actions. But how do we change the norm? Well, we have to change the responses of people in sports when they hear this language. Just like my grandmother would react negatively if I swore in front of her. Education about the harm that is caused by homophobic language, as opposed to general education about the LGBTQ community, can help. Researchers also suggest that captains of sports teams could be given the responsibility to set new standards of behavior. This has worked in schools. Popular kids were asked to stop using discriminatory language and challenging the language used by others. Studies have found big changes in behavior. If you want to see more about the psychology of why this is, you can check out my bystander effect video. So what can we take away from here? Well, let's break it down. It is safe to say that we all want the LGBTQ community to feel welcome and safe in all spaces, including sports. 
The way we've been tackling this issue is by focusing on changing people's attitudes. We want them to be accepting and kind to the LGBTQ community. However, while this approach has definitely changed attitudes, it has not changed the very thing that makes LGBTQ athletes feel unwelcome and unsafe, the homophobic language. To stop this language, we need to change the norms in sports. Researchers also think this approach could be used to stop sexist and racist language. Hopefully this can help make the sports world a more welcoming and inclusive place for everyone. I would like to give a special shout out to Eric Dennison and his colleagues at Monash University and the University of British Columbia for alerting me to this research. If you'd like to learn more about their research or find the studies I used to make this video, you can check out all the links in the description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.